Hi, this is Eric Smith. I'm going to uh, shoot this video. This is kind of impromptu. I was thinking about doing this this morning after seeing something on the news. Uh, so uh, I don't really know how long this video is going to be. It might be a lot longer than I want it to be, but I hope that you will listen uh, take the time to hear what I'm saying. This is definitely directed to the body of Christ. And it's about a really important subject. But before I get into that, I want to start like I normally do with scripture. Because we should really start with that. And these verses I'm going to read is really going to set the stage for what I'm going to talk about in this video. So I want to go to uh, the book of James first. Chapter 3. And I want to read verses 5 through 12. And this is the word of God. Even so, the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea, is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be that the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. In these verses in the book of James, it's talking about the tongue, and it's talking about the things that come out of our mouths. And James is saying that the tongue can't even be tamed. All kind of wicked things come out. And in these verses, James is letting us know as Christians, we should not be inconsistent in our speech. That's why the last part of the verses were saying, out of the mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. And he goes, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. We shouldn't be saying something wicked and something quote unquote good out of the same mouth. We should be consistent in our speech as Christians. Now we can fail sometimes. But consistency is the key here. We should be saying the right thing, things, and we shouldn't be saying the wrong things as Christians. I want to go to Proverbs 16, 27, because um, it has a similar theme to it. And Proverbs 16, 27 reads, an ungodly man diggeth up evil, and in his lips there is a burning fire. So in this verse, it's telling us that an ungodly man literally digs up evil. He wants to do evil things. And because of it, his lips are a burning fire. Some wicked things are going to come out of his mouth because he's digging up evil. He has evil intent. If he has evil intent, it's going to come out of his mouth. And then let's go to Matthew uh, chapter 15. And here we're going to hear the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Matthew 15, 11 reads, well, I'm going to read verse 10. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth the man. So Jesus is saying, the things you eat don't defile you. Uh, the context of these verses, they're talking about the dietary laws of the Old Testament. And Jesus is kind of setting them straight here. It's not the food that defiles you. It's what comes out of your mouth that defiles you. That's why later on in the same chapter, going from verses 16 to 20, um, this is what Jesus said. Verse 16, and Jesus said, Are you also yet without understanding? Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly, and is cast out into the drought. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. 
These are all the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. So the Lord Jesus Christ is setting um, their thinking straight, so to speak. He's letting them know that the thing that defiles the man actually comes from their heart. And what comes from your heart comes out of your mouth. And again, I've said this in other videos, the heart's not talking about the heart beating in our chest. It's talking about our mind, our emotions, the whole being of man. Now, the reason I'm reading these verses is to set the stage for what I'm about to talk about in this video. Because what comes out of our mouths and the things that we're saying has an intent to it, and it's in the, the intent of our heart. What we say talks about what we're really thinking and what we're really feeling and what we really want to do. So, today is November 3rd, and as many of you know, it was like election day yesterday. So, I was curious about the election results in the state of Virginia. I don't know if you realize it, there's a lot of things going on there. So, I'm looking at the results and I'm finding out that the Republican candidate at the time, because this was late last night, was in the lead. He was up like 50% to 49%, and he was up by like 80,000 votes. And there was like 95% of the votes left, 95% uh, um, that were counted, and there's like 5% more that had to be counted. It looks like he was going to win this election, which is kind of amazing considering the things that, um, like Virginia is basically um, a blue state, so to speak. It's a Democratic state. And Apparently, the state voted for Biden big time, and now this Republican was winning. So I'm watching this, and the Republican's name is Glenn Yonkin, and he ended up really defeating the Democrat guy, which is Terry McAuliffe, and they are running for governor. And so now this Republican is now the governor. And the reason I truly believe that he won was all the things that were going on in Virginia, particularly as it pertained to um, the public school system. Um, in another video, I spoke about uh, what was happening in Virginia, uh, Loudoun County School Board, not to go into it too deeply, but they literally covered up a rape. A transgender boy, this boy that was dressed as a girl, raped he raped a girl, basically, in the school bathroom, and the school covered it up. And the school board was covering up a lot of other things, in addition to them having all kinds of wicked books in the store, uh, and, and you know, in the library, excuse me, um, about LGBTQ things and transgender things. And there was a lot of things about mask mandates and vaccine mandates. All this stuff was going on. And what was happening is there were a lot of people that were going to the school districts, not just in Virginia and other states as well, but particularly in Virginia, complaining about all this stuff. They saw that the school district had gone woke and they were like, listen, we're complaining about it. We don't like this. And the school district and even the government there in Virginia weren't taking the people seriously. They were basically dismissing their complaints and they were legitimate complaints. So when this Republican started running, he ran on a basic Republican platform, but he really started stressing these things that were going on in public school. And I think that turned the tide uh, for him and he won. But what was amazing is <laughs> after he won, after he won, or right before he, he won, the mainstream media which is basically liberal and left-leaning, and, and, and that's not an opinion. You can just watch, you know, MSNBC, CNN, NBC, CBS, ABC. You can watch all of these stations and see that they're left-leaning, they're liberal-leaning. Well, when they were calling this election, they started saying some really crazy things. And I, I really want to just showcase some of the things that were being said on these stations as this Republican was winning and then eventually won. Because remember, this is the news and they're just supposed to report the news. Now I know they give their opinions every now and then and 
but reporters should report report the news. Now, granted, you know, these are people that are giving commentary, so they can give their opinion on election night. But their opinion should be based on fact. So here are some of the things that were being said. Van Jones, and he's a CNN correspondent, and I guess he worked um, for the Clintons. This is what he said. The people that voted for the Republican Glenn Youngkin shows, it, I'm, I hope I quote him completely, the emergence of the Delta variant of Trumpism. <laughs> so what he's saying is, if they vote for this guy, it's like the Delta, Delta, uh, Delta variant of Trumpism. Like, he just brought Donald Trump into the conversation. Now, for people that are not aware, Donald Trump's not our president anymore. So to bring up Donald Trump was kind of funny. But then Rachel Maddow of MSNBC basically said that Fox News gave free campaign help to Youngkin by promoting his run for office and spotlighting it. So she was basically saying, you know what, why he won? Because Fox News gave him free publicity. They're conservative, they're right-leaning, so they were just ramming it down the, the viewers' throats, and that made them go out and vote for them. And I find that kind of hypocritical and kind of funny because all these other stations are left-leaning, and guess what they promote? The Democrats. But when the when Fox does it or any other conservative outlet, all of a sudden you want to bring it out. It's like, oh, they helped them get into office. Well, guess what? They help Democrats get into office because I, I so I think that's kind of funny. Here's another one. Nicole Wallace of M MSNBC claims that CRT isn't real. And that's what was moving suburban voters to vote for the GOP because it was about CRT and it just wasn't real. And when it talks about suburban voters, it's really talking about people in those rural areas. Now, what's so funny is she's saying that CRT isn't real. It's just a figment of people's imagination. It just doesn't exist. And I'm like, there's so much evidence that shows that CRT is real all over the place. But she was really demonizing these people that were going to the school boards complaining about the same thing the wokeness, uh, the CRT. She was basically saying, you know what? You people are complaining to the school boards about all this woke stuff, all this CRT stuff. You're crazy. It doesn't exist. Joy Reid of MSNBC, and this one was really insulting, said education, which was a key, a key concern for the Virginia voters. The school district was a key component of, of why they went and wanted to go out to vote. They were really concerned about the things that were going on. But Joy Reid said that education is cold for white parents who don't like the idea of teaching about race. Now, did you hear that? They had a legitimate concern. And what Joy Reid did was she said, oh, that's the white people out in the suburbs that don't want to talk to their kids about, you know, racism. They don't want to learn. So they're trying to use education as a cold word to say, oh, you don't want any of this stuff in 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 uh, the schools. You don't want to talk about critical race theory, though the other commentator says it doesn't exist. So that's, you know, it's kind of funny. But you don't want to talk about any of that stuff because you're, you white people don't want to talk about racism. You don't want your kids to learn about it. You just want to keep them ignorant. Uh, kind of insinuating that they're racist themselves. Now, this is all going on as the Republican is winning and eventually won. They're getting on mainstream media outlets in front of everybody who watches them, and for whoever does watch MSNBC or CNN, and just basically saying all these things. <laughs> so... Here's the question I have to ask. I'm just laughing because it was, I mean, I'm looking at the stuff and I was, it was just funny. What is the, what is the mostly left-leaning media doing? What are they doing? They are shaming. That's what they're doing. They're trying to shame people. And you know what they're doing? 
they're shaming based on a false narrative or a faulty premise. This is super important as we go through this video. This is what they do. They shame based on a false narrative or a faulty premise. So what I want to do now is I want to take the time to demonstrate how this works. I want to show you how they do this, okay? And it's really important that you pay attention to this. I think a lot of Christians are probably aware of this. I think a lot of uh, unsaved conservatives are aware of this. But it needs to be said and it needs to be pointed out because this is going on all the time. This is the norm in our world right now, particularly in the United States of America. So let me take an example and show you how this is done. Let's take something like um, abortion, okay? So you're speaking about abortion and this is your concern, okay? As someone who's against abortion, you're murdering a life in the womb. Now as Christians, we would ascribe to that completely. But there's even unsafe conservatives that basically say, hey, it's a life in a womb and you're murdering that life. Here is the shaming. This is how they would shame you if you spoke about that. You don't care about women's reproductive rights or a woman's right to choose. So did you catch it? This is the concern. You're killing babies in the womb. They're going to shame you by saying <laughs> you don't care about women's reproductive rights or a woman's right to choose. So here is the what? The false narrative or the faulty premise that the right, so to speak, to reproduce equates to murder. Or murdering a human being is a right at all. And as, as Christians, we can say absolutely not. And that's based on Exodus 20, 13, Genesis 9, 6, and particularly the end of Proverbs 6, 17. That's one, one of the seven things that God hates. He hates uh, the shedding of innocent blood. So, but do you catch it? This is my concern. They're going to shame you, and it's based on what? That false narrative or that faulty premise. So, here was the concern in Virginia. CRT and wokeness, as well as LGBTQ agenda, being promoted in the school. In fact, they thought it was that woke narrative that led to that transgender boy raping the girl. Because if none of that stuff was accepted, it probably wouldn't have happened. So that's their concern. This is how they shame that concern. CRT doesn't exist. White parents don't want kids to learn about racism. Did you catch it? They have a legitimate concern. And then these left-leaning media people did what? They shame these people. So what's the false narrative and the faulty premise? CRT is non-existent when there is evidence of it. It's non-existent, but there's evidence of it. And they're <laughs> accusing people of not wanting to talk to their kids about race because of the CRT narrative. You can't say that about the parents. You can't say and that they're just the white parents. There's some African Americans that went to those school meetings too that were like, hey, we don't like this. But you know what they did? They they put this little false narrative in and said, oh, it's those white people out in the suburbs. It's those white people out in the rural areas. Well, you know what? I am sh quite sure you can't read their minds and you don't know if they care about racism or not based on your faulty premise or your false narrative. You don't know that. You're just throwing it out there. But that's what they do. They'll put that out there and they'll try to demonize somebody that has a concern. And let me tell you something. They've been demonized so much that the federal government was trying to say that people that go to school board meetings and complain about it equates to them being terrorists. You see how far shaming can go? It, it actually goes that far. All right, how about this? How about COVID vaccine mandates? Let's talk about this for a second. Here's another example. Here's the concern. 
about COVID, uh, COVID max, um, vaccine mandates, if I can speak. Hmm. It's a personal health decision. That's a concern. I'm unsure of the side effects or the effectiveness of it. That's a concern. I've had COVID already and I have natural immunity. So they don't feel like they should be mandated to take a vaccine. That's a concern. It isn't right for me to lose my job over it. That's a big concern because the mandate's basically saying, if you don't take the vaccine and have proof of it, you could lose your job. So don't come into work. And that's not anything I'm making up. There are videos all over YouTube that you can click into where people are actually filming themselves being escorted out of their jobs. And we're talking nurses, doctors, firemen, police officers. This stuff is happening because of the max, uh, the vaccine mandate that is pushed by our president, President Biden. I'm not making that up. That's exactly what's happening. Okay. But it's legitimate concerns. It's legitimate. It's my legitimate concern. Let me tell you something. I'm going to give full disclosure. I did not take the COVID vaccine and I'm not going to take it. For all the reasons I just gave and all the reasons everybody else is bringing up. Look, I don't even take the flu vaccine. I'm healthy. I'm not sticking anything into my arm. I, I, I'm healthy. I, I shouldn't have to take that. But you know what? Now they're mandating it and going, if you don't take it, you can lose your job. Because isn't that what President Biden said? Employees 100 or more, if you have employees, uh, 100 employees or more in your job, then this is what we're dictating, that they take the vaccine because we want to stop this pandemic of, of COVID. And now people are losing their jobs over it. So that's a legitimate concern. Here's the shaming. And you know what? It was our president that did the best shaming I think I ever heard. He had a town hall meeting and they were talking about it. And he basically said this, rights, talking about people having the right to do what they want. He says, rights, so you have the right to kill someone with your COVID? You catch the shaming? The shaming is if you don't take this vaccine, you're going to catch it and kill someone. And the shaming begins there, and then there's a whole bunch of other narratives where they're saying basically the same thing. Well, let's look at the false narrative and the faulty premise, that the only way to stop the spread of COVID is taking the vaccine. That's the narrative. If you don't take the vaccine, <laughs> you're going to catch it, and someone else is going to catch it, and you're going to die. That's what the media is kicking. If you don't take this vaccine, then it means that you're just this villain. It, it means you don't care about others because you will catch COVID. See, the vaccine is going to prevent that. If you don't take the vaccine, you're absolutely 100% going to catch it and spread it. It doesn't matter that the death rate for COVID since last year when it began is under 1%. Listen, go to the CDC site and look at how many deaths there have been that they ascribe to COVID. And take that percentage and look at the population of the United States of America. It is less than 1%. In fact, I think the last time I checked it, it was like 0.7% of people that died. And do you know that not everybody that catches COVID is going to die? I know many people that have caught it and they've had relatives that caught it. And guess what? They were sick for a week. It was pretty terrible. And then they got over it. They're, they're fine. COVID is not death, you know, it's not the death sentence for everybody. It, it, it really isn't. But the media kicks this narrative. That's why you see on TV shows and like um, news broadcasts, this is how many COVID cases there are. This is how many deaths there are. They, because they want to scare you half to death. And it also doesn't matter that shots don't prevent COVID. You can still catch it. Do you know that? That shots don't prevent you from catching COVID. That's why you got to get a booster shot. There are plenty of people that have caught COVID even after they took the shot. So there's this narrative that if you don't take the shot, you're going to catch it and then you're going to spread it to someone. No. 
It's false, but again, it's shaming. So, what does shaming have to do with the verses at the beginning of this video? Well, let me tell you. These are things that are spoken that are inconsistent, ungodly, and a reflection of the sinful heart. And that's what the left-leaning le uh, media is doing. They're showing the wickedness of their heart by the things that they're saying by shaming people. Now, I want to mention this, that unsaved conservatives are not immune to shaming. Their flesh will kick in too. So <laughs> there's people that are on co the conservative side that can also shame and they can also be fleshly. The majority of the time, though, conservatives have logic and facts. So to lower their standards of argumentation to shame really isn't a good thing. A lot of these conservatives that shame really shouldn't because they have facts on their side. They have logic on their side. Not all of them, but I would say the majority of them. That's why if you listen to a lot of them, it's like it's hard to argue against facts. You, you can't. So what you do is you throw in what? You throw in emotion. You throw in vagueness. And this is where shaming can really blossom when you start doing that. But the left tends to do it because what? They have a false narrative and a faulty premise. And look at what they did to former President Trump. This is the biggest example of shaming. Trump was not a career politician, so he didn't know how to speak like a politician. He didn't. Remember, he's the guy that's had <laughs> the TV show, The Apprentice, and he's like, you're fired. And when Trump speaks, he just says what's on his mind. He was brash, egotistical, profane, and many times he was rude. Now listen, I voted for President Trump, but those things I'm saying about him is true. In fact, he also violated verses about speech as well. He demonstrated his lack of patience and that he was conceited. So I'm going to actually tell you that that's true. Okay, I mean, it's absolutely true. But here's the thing. Because of this, the leftist media could take rude statements Trump made and use sound bites to take them out of context. They could paint him as a racist, a homophobe, etc. They could just paint a picture of him. Now, let me tell you something. Donald Trump is this type of person. And I knew this when he was voted president um, originally, okay? Um, because I'm gonna be honest, the first his first uh, term, I didn't vote for anybody because I wasn't sure. And I just said, hey, I'm, I'm just not gonna vote. But when it came time to vote again, I saw how President Trump was running the country and I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna vote for him because he governs really well. But, he has no filter for his mouth. So a lot of times he's like this. If you're against me, I'm just going to talk about you. He's an equal opportunity offender. He doesn't care about the color of your skin. He doesn't care about your social background. He doesn't care about any of that. If you don't like him, he's going to, he's going to say something to you. And when he says something to you, sometimes it's profane, sometimes it's nasty, and sometimes it's hardcore. Because he's just not a politician. He's not like the rest of the Republicans. He's just like, you know, they try to speak eloquently. They try to be gracious, even though someone's dogging them out. Trump's not like that. You dog him out, he's going to dog you out worse, and he's going to do it better. Okay? But because of that, they painted a narrative of Trump being a bad leader based on his attitudes and his words more than his actual policies. It's a tack that works well with someone who has no filter for his mouth. If you don't have a filter for your mouth, you can pick sound bites all over the place. Yet Trump was always hardworking, and shaming him convinced half of this country that he wasn't that he was actually worse than he truly was. Trump worked really hard. He was a hardworking president. I mean, I have to tell you, if you examine the things he did and how hard he worked, you would know that, man, this guy is trying to do everything he promised to do. But you know what? The left-leaning media was just painting this picture of him based on the things he said, based on his personality. And 
as a Christian, I can honestly say Trump was more ungodly with his mouth and attitude than his actual policies. This is the difference here. And I want to take a second to go on a, a, a rabbit trail. A lot of times Christians will vote Republican and other Christians are going like, how could you vote for that Republican? How could you vote for that guy? He's this, 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 and this. And normally when they're talking about it, it's a character assassination thing. Now, that doesn't work all the time with every Republican, you know, because they tried that back in the day with George Bush. They were saying all these things about George Bush. And now that George Bush isn't president anymore, even, even some liberals are like, you know what, he's not really a bad guy. But they were calling him a racist back then too. But with Donald Trump, because of his personality and his mouth, it is easy to just pick on him. So when people saw, particularly Christians, saw how he was governing, they were like, you know what? I think he governs closest to biblical values as it pertains to policy. Not as it pertains to what? His personality and his mouth. And that's the key. I could find plenty of Bible verses where President Trump violated it, you know, violates things. You know, he's prideful. Um, he has a, a, a wicked mouth. He can be sarcastic. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about that. And people are like, well, how are you going to vote for a person like that? But you know what? His mouth and his attitude never affected his policies. And his policies were more in line with things that I see in Scripture. You know what? I can't say the same thing about Biden. And you know what? Biden's mouth, though he doesn't cuss and swear and as nasty as Trump could be sometimes, is actually just as bad. He'll say things just as bad and nobody says anything about that. Like here's an example. They called Trump a racist based on all kind of comments and half of those things were taken out of context because he wasn't attacking any, you know, African Americans. He would, or, or anybody. He was just saying, hey, if somebody comes over the border and they're drug dealers, they're bad people. But they would take stuff out of context. But Biden was on a radio show before he, you know, they voted for him, voted him in as president. And um, there was a black host, uh, Charlemagne the God, I think he calls himself. I don't like that name, but I think that's what he calls himself. And he was asking, you know, Biden what he was going to do for black folks. And then Biden basically say, said, listen, if you don't vote for me, you ain't black. Anybody can look that up. Nobody called him a racist for that. But Trump is a racist because you just don't like his mouth. And he's complaining about some things that are legitimate and he just doesn't articulate it well. But see, that's what happens. So when we're voting for people, listen, their attitude and their mouth and even their personal conduct has a lot to do with things. And we should never dismiss that. But if they govern correctly, as a Christian, I'm not voting for a pastor or a ministry leader. I'm voting whoever is going to govern the best based on biblical principles. And you know what? President Trump wanted to get rid of abortion. He wanted to defund Planned Parenthood. He wanted a wall to keep our sovereignty and keep illegal aliens out. He was doing everything to stimulate uh, our economy and get growth. These are things that a leader should be doing. So when it comes to Trump, I wasn't buying the narrative and the shaming that they were doing. So I'm mentioning all these things about shaming and what the unsaved world is doing. And you could be asking yourself, hey, all right, you're talking about all this stuff. But how does the shaming get into the church? And that's what we're going to start talking about now. We're going to start talking about how the same tactics are used in the church. Now listen, and this is true. The CRT, woke, social justice, even COVID vaccine mandate, all these narratives are, that which come from the unsaved left is now the game plan in many of the churches. It's been happening all over the place. Whether you're talking about 
you know, individual churches or the Southern Baptist Convention, all these people that are kicking it. And I mean, it's all over the church. You have the people like Robin DiAngelo and Ibram X. Kendi that kick this stuff. You got Jamar Tisby, Eric Mason, um, oh my goodness, Matt Chandler, just a bunch of people, you know, Lecrae, the rapper, Phil Vischer, the VeggieTales guy. There are a lot of people that are kicking this woke stuff in church. And if you don't believe me, just look up, you know, woke preacher clips. Got a lot of videos on it. Go to my buddy Will's channel, Bottom Line Dad. He has a lot of videos. Um, go to uh, my buddy Jason, uh, that's um, you know, Dear Woke Christian. Go to his channel. You're going to see a lot of stuff. They, they have videos. They have audios. They have proof all over the place. Go to Conversations That Matter with John Harris. He's been kicking this stuff for years. You know, people <laughs> try to make him out to be, they try to shame him too. But all this stuff is coming into the church, and it's been in the church. And notice, it's the same tactics. The same tactics are used to shame Christians about some of the same problems that we see outside of the church. For instance, talking about racism is a big thing lately in churches. So when it's brought up, here is the Christian's right response. Okay? Here's the Christian's right response. To wokeness, CRT, it's all wrapped around racism and oppression and all this stuff. So as a Christian, we hear these things and we hear people in the church bringing it up or even fellow Christians bringing it up. And so here's our concern. That the handling of racism is done, and we're talking about in the churches, minus the truth of God's word. It wants to employ ungodly ideologies which violate Colossians 2.8 and 2 Corinthians. And I forget the verse here, so let me just look at my Bible. 2 Corinthians 10.5. And that's, it says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ because these things exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. So as Christians, we're like, we can certainly talk about racism, but where's the word of God? The word of God's not in it at all. And if it's not in it at all, we shouldn't be discussing it outside of the word of God. So that's the Christian's main concern. Many Christians have brought that, that concern up. You want to catch the shaming? Here's the shaming. You don't want to discuss racism. You don't care about the plight of the oppressed. You have white privilege. You're racist and you actually don't know it. CRT is an analytical tool. You're not living the gospel. Any of this stuff sounds familiar? Have people said this stuff before? Yep, absolutely. Absolutely, they've been saying that. And you know what? Because of that, we should have an answer. Because there's what? A false narrative and there's a faulty premise. There absolutely is. So let's go over some of those complaints, okay? And let's catch the false narrative or the faulty premise in some of these complaints. And by the way, there's a whole bunch of other complaints as well. Some of them are just offshoots of some of that stuff I just read, but there's just a bunch of them. And you know what? People in the church are bringing these things up. So the first one, you don't want to discuss racism. <laughs> it's the silliest thing I've ever heard. Yes, Christians actually have no problem with discussing racism. But we do so based on the truth of God's word, John 17, 17, and 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. We want to bring to bear the Bible. What does the Bible say about race, and how do we go from there with the Bible? 
we're going to take Bible verses and we're going to say, okay, you're talking about racism, let's talk about it. We can show that racism is hatred in the heart. We can show that it's partiality. We can show that there's oneness in Christ and that race shouldn't be brought up. So we can bring up Galatians 3.28, Colossians 3.11. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 12 through 27. We can bring up Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. So we can bring the word of God to bear to those things. We can go to Acts 17 and show how God is the creator and made um, everyone from one blood in all the nations. We can show how to combat that with the word of God. So Christians don't mind talking about racism they just don't want to talk about it from a perspective of ungodliness. You don't care about the plight of the oppressed. Okay? Actually, all Christians care about the plight of the, of the oppressed. But, there must have, but they must actually have actual evidence of that oppression. It can't be just an assertion. It can't be vague. If it is done in the church, it is a church discipline thing per Matthew 18, 15 through 20. So if there's some oppression going on in the church, that's a church discipline thing. Read those verses in Matthew 18. We need to go to the person that offended us, then we need to take someone else if he doesn't want to listen, and then if he doesn't want to listen again, we take it to the pastor and the elders of the church, and then discipline is what? Put on that person. Now, all the time I hear about all these things that are supposed to be going on in the church, and it's so hardcore that people have to be, you know, kicking CRT. I'm like, where's the church discipline? I don't ever hear about that. Okay? Outside of the church, amongst the unsaved world, it is a gospel thing. Because we're dealing with the what? The unsaved. So go out there and help people. That's fine. Christians can do that. But at the same time, give the gospel per, per Romans 10, 14 through 17. Because until you give the gospel and an unsaved person is saved, regenerated by the Holy Spirit, guess what they're going to do? They're going to sin. And sin means prejudice, oppression, everything. So if they're doing it outside the church, you can't legislate that away. You can't march that away. And you can't complain that away. What you can do is give the gospel and hope that the Lord saves them. They're going to have a changed heart, and then that's going to give them changed speech and a changed way of doing things. They're going to be new creatures in Christ. Okay? Let's look at this. Oh, and by the way, for that oppression thing, that also applies to systemic racism. If you're going to be talking about systemic racism, give the evidence. What's the system? Name it. And what's the person or people behind the system? So if you're saying it's the schools, name the people in those schools that are doing it. If it's the police, name the police officers that are kicking that. If it's the government, name the government officials that are passing policies that are racist. That's why when they said President Trump is a racist, policy-wise, what things was he passing to show that he was a racist? Was he passing, uh, you know, were they presenting bills to him to have black only in the bathrooms again and have blacks sit in the back of the bus? Was he passing policies to go back to, to Jim, uh, Jim Crow laws or redlining? See, it's easy to say he said all this, but what policies is he passing? And again, if this stuff is happening in the church and there's systemic racism in the church, that's a church discipline thing. Name the people that are doing it. What <laughs> pastors, elders, deacons, whatever, are getting together and doing these things in the church. They need to be disciplined. Okay? And if it's outside the church, again, give the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to change their hearts. All right. Here's another one. You have white privilege. This is silly. First, Define it. Define what white privilege is. Exa tell me exactly what you're talking about. Second, show some evidence of it. You have to show that there's evidence of that white privilege. Third, show how having privilege is a sin if you haven't directly hurt an another person. 
that's important because guess what? Someone being privileged isn't necessarily a sin. If somebody is super rich and they've, they've treated their workers fairly because they own all these businesses, they give bonuses, they, they create jobs, and that person passes on the mantle to one of his kids where now they inherit the business and they, they have an inheritance of money and all this other good stuff. Is that bad? Absolutely not. That's not a bad thing. So what? He has a privilege. In fact, it's good that he has a, a privilege financially because now he has more money where he can give to somebody else from his heart. We act like having a privilege is a bad thing. It's not a negative thing. Fourth, point out that if you begin with the words white or black, you're defeating the purpose of combating favoritism or partiality because you show it is built into your what? Your very insertion. You're, you're showing that you're partial just by saying white. The minute you're in church and you start saying white and black, depending on the context of how you're describing it, the minute you say that in church and it's accusing someone of some something, you're already losing the battle biblically because now you're showing your partiality. Why are you bringing up the melanin count on somebody in church. So all this stuff about white privilege is ridiculous. You're just trying to shame people. How about this one? You're racist and you don't know it. Again, show how they are, show how they are actually racist with direct evidence <laughs> so that they can know it because if they don't know it, they need you to point it out. So you need to point out what specific thing they did. And notice when they're always talking about you're racist and you don't know it, it's usually talking about someone who's Caucasian, more so than someone who's African American. So that's a side note. It's always kind of one-sided, isn't it? If there's no evidence, then it is bad judgment. You can't think someone is racist based on leaning on your own understanding because Proverbs 3, 5 tells you not to do that. And you can't have lack of evidence because the Bible is right with verses that tell you to what? Judge with correct judgment. In fact, the Matthew chapter 7, I think verses 1 through 5, which everybody likes to misquote, Jesus Christ is actually talking about right judgment. You don't judge from a self-righteous viewpoint. And a lot of times that's what this is. You're judging somebody else from a victim mentality. I'm right because I'm a victim, didn't prove I was a victim, and you're wrong. So I'm actually a privileged class and you're, I'm better than you. You think you're privileged because you're white and you have money, but you're not. I'm actually the privileged person because I'm a victim. You see what, You see that judgment is not what? It's not biblical. It's not based on the word of God. And as Christians, we're supposed to judge correctly with righteous judgment. How about this one? CRT is an analytical tool. It is only an analytical tool if it points to the Word of God as the solution to the problem, period. If it is used to analyze the social ills of the unsaved world and it doesn't line up with what the Bible says about sin, and think about these verses like Romans 3, 9 through 20, Jeremiah 17, 9, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, and 1 John 3, 4. If it doesn't line up with what the Bible says about sin, it is faulty. It's not a tool at all because it's not pointing to the Word of God and it's not pointing to what God says about sin. And if the solution, quote unquote, to the ills is unbiblical, it should be rejected. That's why CRT is not an analytical tool, because it's not helping you. You're, you're going to go to CRT to tell you about racism and all this other stuff. What? You think the Word of God is not sufficient for that? You think the Word of God is not going to tell you about the sin nature of people and why they do the things they do? And then CRT is going to point all these things out from a secular viewpoint, from a Marxist viewpoint, to be honest with you, and then their solution 
is a Marxist solution. No, we're Christians. We go to the word of God. How about this one? You're not living the gospel. Let me tell you something. If following ungodly ideologies that are called CRT, woke, social justice, or any other name you want to put on it, is living the gospel, it is a different gospel. It's a work, a works-based gospel. Galatians 1, 6 through 9 warns about this false gospel, this different gospel, this perverted gospel. The Bible describes and dictates our sanctified walk as Christians. When people talk about living out the gospel, you know how you live out the gospel? From the word of God. It tells you how you're supposed to walk as a Christian. It tells you about your sanctification. CRT does not tell me how to work, uh, walk like a Christian. Social justice doesn't tell me how to walk like a Christian. Intersectionality doesn't tell me how to walk like a Christian. All this stuff doesn't tell me that. It's the Bible that does that. Now, do you get the point? This is coming in the church. You have a legitimate concern about something. And you talk about it. In fact, the COVID vaccine mandate is another thing that's in the church now that the woke crowd's trying to kick. You got people telling you, boy, if you don't take the, you know, the COVID vaccine, that you're not really a Christian. You're not really um, obeying the government, you know, like Romans 13 tells you. You're not loving your neighbor. Listen. That is foolishness. Again, it's shaming. People have legitimate concerns, particularly Christians, about all these things, and you're trying to shame them. And you're shaming them with what? Again, it is a false narrative and a faulty premise. If you're trying to shame somebody like that, in the church, it's wrong. Now, let me be honest with you. Christians can be ashamed of their sin, convicted by the word of God, and by loving brethren that are bringing that up. That's fine. It should be that way. You know, iron sharpens iron. We should help one another, but we should correct one another. So if you're shamed, ashamed in that way, that's fine as a Christian. But if you're just shaming somebody based on ungodly ideologies, no, particularly if a Christian brought up legitimate concerns and have, you know, Bible verses to back up what they're saying. You shouldn't be shaming them because that's what the outside world does. That's what CNN does. That's what MSNBC does. That's what CBS does. That's what ABC does. That's what liberals do. That's what the left does. That's what they do. They shame people with what? A false narrative and a faulty premise. And as Christians, we shouldn't be following that. That's ungodliness. So I'm going to end this video by saying this. And this is important. Do not comply. Let me repeat. As Christians, do not comply. A while back, Josh McDowell, he's a Christian apologist, well, he gave in. He complied. The woke, the woke crowd accused him of racism based on a comment he made. And you know what happened? He sent out this public apology and he stepped down from his ministry. Because they shamed him into doing it and he complied. I just saw... A similar thing with, um, and I can't remember the name of the organization. They're out. Uh, they're from Liberty University. They were critiquing some article uh, about Karen Swallow Pryor. I think her name is. She's actually a professor at Liberty University, and she's very progressive. She's very left leaning, and she got on a podcast one time with Phil Vischer, and they were saying some of the dumbest things. And on a side note. Phil Vischer's out of his freaking mind. So you know what? It, 
please forgive me for, for, for saying that, but he's annoying. And Christians, you should stay away from him. You know, the VeggieTales man, if I, he, he's losing his tomatoes, okay? He, he really is. But anyway, this guy was critiquing it in a, a, an article critiquing this interview and critiquing her. Well, she went on social media, I think it was on Twitter or maybe Facebook, and basically played the victim card. Oh, I've been serving at, you know, Liberty University for all these years. This article said all these nasty things about me, blah, blah, blah. And so you know what? The guy who wrote the article that was behind it commented on her tweet or on her Facebook post. I can't remember which one it was. And basically just commented over and over and over again and apologized to the cows came home. And you know what? It still wasn't enough. She still kept on it. And you know what? Go to Conversations That Matter. Go to that YouTube page. John Harris has a whole podcast about it. You'll see what I'm talking about. This is happening to Christians all the time. The woke crowd is shaming Christians to apologize for things that they did not do. Okay? Don't let Christian shaming make you apologize, backtrack, or even leave ministry unless you've actually committed a sin that you need to repent of. If you need to repent, like Psalm 51 type repentance, because you did something, praise God, you should repent. If you've done something wrong, repent of it. But don't let people guilt you or shame you into apologizing or repenting or doing penance for things that you didn't do. This is what they're trying to do. The left does this in politics. The left does this in uh, social uh, things in the world. But in the church, we shouldn't be let, letting people shame us. So do not comply. Okay? Do not comply to being a racist when you're not. Do not comply to think you're not doing the work of a Christian when you are. Do not comply to taking the COVID vaccine because you need to submit to the government, love your neighbor, or you're going to lose your job. Don't comply to that. Listen, I have some videos I shot and a bunch of other people have shot videos concerning this. I have a video where I basically said, if you want to take the, the, the COVID vaccine, it's a matter of conscience. Take it if you want to or don't take it. I had a video about how Christians should submit to the government and how some of these mandates and things don't fall in line with that. I had a video that talked about how people were using love your neighbor to try to shame Christians to take the COVID vaccine. And you know what I did? I went through all the verses that talked about love your neighbor and gave the context of it. In fact, all these videos that I shot, I'll put a link below so you can see. So I'm not going to go into detail about that. But based on those videos and a whole bunch of other videos that Christians have done, do not comply to the COVID vaccine mandate. You are not obligated to do that as a Christian. You're not even obligated to do it by the laws of this land that, that this present administration is trying to usurp. So don't do that. Don't comply to stop calling out this woke ideology as false teaching because it will make you look like a hater. False teaching is false teaching. There are so many scriptures that talk about it, and this stuff is false teaching. So call it out. In fact... Let's go to one no, uh, one set of verses that talk about this in Romans. Romans 16, 17 through 18 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. That describes people that are doing CRT. Mark them and avoid them. Because guess what it says? They're serving their own belly. They're serving their own purposes. And by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. That's what they're doing in the church. They're deceiving people with what? 
good words and fair speeches. They're trying to make things sound good. They're trying to make things sound right. And they're even slapping Bible verses on top of it. So you have, you know, like the Matt Chandlers and, you know, the David Platts have these sermons taking Old Testament verses and taking them out of context and trying to connect it to the oppression of black people today. It's ridiculous. Let me tell you something. It's false teaching. Do not comply to that. Keep calling it out. And the last thing, do not comply to denying the truth of God's word to make the ungodly happy. Do not comply. Because that's what the world wants you to do. They want you to comply. It's almost like a quid pro quo kind of thing. If you will take this vaccine, we'll let you keep your job. They never did this with any other vaccine. And this isn't like that people are walking in with COVID and being irresponsible. These people, they're well, they're wearing masks, they're doing everything. And as Christians, if you feel led to take the vaccine, because your conscience is telling you that, that's fine. But you know what? You should never take it because they mandate it. Because that does not fall in line with submitting to the government. And again, you can go to my video and, I'll, and, and there's an explanation of why that is. But as Christians, don't comply to this stuff, particularly in the church. Don't let people bring shaming into the church. That's what they're doing. Christian shaming is just like left shaming. Don't let it happen. Don't fall for it. You know, it's a what? It's a false narrative and it's a faulty premise. And it's people of the truth because guess what? God's word is truth. It sanctifies us, John 17, 17. Jesus Christ says he is the way, the truth, and the life. We have the truth. So we don't need to let a false narrative fool us or a faulty premise. A false narrative is a lie. A faulty premise is a logical fallacy. We're to be of truth and logic. We're Christians, we're not dumb. We have the word of God from the creator of all things. So don't let anybody bring shaming into the church. The outside world does this. That's exactly what they do. And it works for the most part and people fall for it. In fact, the shaming actually makes people vote the way they want them to vote. I, I would get, and I have no statistics on this, but I bet you half the people that vote Democrat fall for the shaming. They just hear this stuff and they're like, oh, they said it and I hear it 20 times a day on MSNBC, CNN, and all these other stations, so it must be true. That's why most African Americans, what? Vote Democrat. Because they're shaming people and they're telling you exactly what you want to hear. They promise you everything and they give you nothing. That's socialism. And now we bring that kind of thinking into the church. And it's the same thing. They're promising you a solution to racism in the church. And they're showing you nothing because they're actually causing racism. They're causing partiality. When you can have someone say, hey, all the black folks leave your church. And what, form your own church? Sounds like the outside world. Isn't that what they're doing now? Hey, we have places for black, black only because we don't want the white racist to be involved. We know you're white and you're racist even if you don't know you're racist. So blacks need to, to, to be in their own little safe space. So now we're practicing segregation. We fought so for so long so there's not segregation. Now we're going backwards. And now we want to go backwards in the church. 
This is what CRT, woke social justice does. And if you let people shame you, you fall right in the line with it. And you know what? It's foolishness. Don't let anybody shame you into doing something that's illogical and ungodly. So I appreciate anybody who listened to this whole video. I apologize like I normally do when I get excited and I misspeak. And I'm sure there's so many other things I could have covered. And I apologize that I didn't cover everything. And if you want to leave any comments in the comment section about anything I spoke about, please do so. But, you know, like I like to say in my quick look videos, please do not be snarky. Please do not be profane. We want to be Christ-like in everything we say and do. But, dear Christian, don't let somebody shame you. Christian shaming is just as bad as the unsaved left shaming. And you know what? We don't want to fall for it, and we don't want to comply, because that's what they want you to do. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching, and God bless.